All right, uh, good evening, everyone. We want to thank you all for joining us for our exclusive KPRC2 Back to School conversation. To our panelists and all the participants, we want to thank you for taking the time to address this very important issue during such a time of uncertainty. We're going to get started in just a moment after a brief opening statement from our panelists. But first, Dominique has the ground rules. Yes, uh, from what I understand, all participants are going to remain muted throughout the conversation, but we do want to hear from you. So you will be allowed to submit your questions in the comment section. If you are comfortable being in front of the camera, and don't be shy, please, you can use the raise the hand feature and a member on our team will unmute you and then you'll be able to ask your question. Uh, we, we ask that uh, you all remain cordial and respectful at all times, of course. We will first address questions that were submitted via email and then answer questions that you, the participants, submit uh, during the conversation. Uh, now to our panelists, uh, we have joining us today medical doctor Taraya Richmond. We also have infectious disease specialist Dr. Linda Yancey with Memorial Hermann Katie Hospital. And educational psychologist and licensed professional counselor supervisor Dr. Rochelle Whitaker. Also on our list is Fort Bend County Judge K.P. George. And we have uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner's Director of Education Juliet Stepecci with the City of Houston. And healthcare IT specialist and mother Ebony Griffin. Thank you all for being with us today. We're going to go ahead and get our, our opening r remarks done, and we're going to begin with Dr. Taraya Richmond. Doctor, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you all for having me this evening. And yes, I am Dr. Taraya Richmond, a family medicine physician, but I'm also a mother, um, a public health professional, and in private practice. So this subject is very dear to me. Um, I want to just remind everyone of what we're looking at as far as COVID cases. And right now we have over 6 million cases in the United States. Um, and then if we look at Texas, we have over uh, six, 670,000 cases uh, Texas wide as far as COVID is concerned. We also know that um, over the summer in child care centers, we saw about 1,300 cases with children, but we also saw double that in the staff. And so these are all things that we need to take into consideration when it comes to COVID and our children going back to school. And again, this is very personal to me because I have an 11 year old in sixth grade and I also have a now six year old in first grade. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Dr. Taria Richmond. We appreciate that. And now we want to open it up to infectious disease specialist, Dr. Linda Yancey with Memorial Hermann Katie Hospital. Linda? Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd just like to echo, you know, the numbers of the COVID cases that we have here in the Houston area right now. After that initial peak in July, we've seen a decline in cases up until the last couple of weeks when we've begun to see a slight uptick. And of course, we've just come off a holiday weekend. The kids are going back to school. So we're all holding our breath and wondering what the fall is going to bring us. And uh, I too am a mother. I have four little kids. And I understand on a very personal level how difficult these decisions can be to send the kids back, to keep them home. It's a very individual decision for every family and for every kid. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. We're happy to have you for sure. Uh, next, Dr. Rochelle Whitaker, psychologist. Hi, I am Dr. Rochelle Whitaker. Thank you guys for having me. Um, yes, and so I am a mental health therapist and a parent coach. And so what I'm hearing a lot from parents is the uncertainty, not sure what to do, what to send, if they should send their kids back to school or if they should continue with virtual. And we know that virtual comes with its own set of complications and challenges and issues. And I too am a mother of two. So I know very well how those complications and challenges come into play when you're trying to work as well. So thank you all for having me. Dr. Whitaker, you nailed it with the, the lack of, of consistency. And I know we'll get into that throughout this conversation. I wanna bring up now Fort Bend County Judge KP George, who you see on our newscast quite a bit. Judge? <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm, it's an honor to be part of this um, um, uh, panel. And, um, you know, uh, you're talking about uncertainty. Last uh, 
almost seven months every day I dealt with uncertainty. I have no idea what is coming next day. And so uh, it is an important discussion before become uh, the Fort Bend County Judge. I was a school board member for Fort Bend ISD for four and a half years. So um, uh, Fort Bend is a large school district. So I, I, I really understand the concern um, our parents, our community is facing, all the dilemma they are facing, what to do and where to start. And I hope this discussion with all this experts can shed some light uh, into their, you know, uncertainty. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. All right, our pleasure to have you here for sure, sir. Uh, and uh, next, Juliet Stepecci, Director of Education for the City of Houston. Well, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be able to join you here tonight. Uh, on behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner, I just wanna say thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, participate in this very important conversation. I know that uh, the only certain thing that we've had over the past couple of months is tremendous uncertainty, but I will say that there has been a tremendous amount of effort on the part of schools and healthcare providers and nonprofits and different government entities collaboratively working together to try to build transformative innovation so that way we can better serve the community in this time of crisis. I've seen extraordinary resilience. I've seen the Houston strong spirit but I know that our children, our teachers and parents, they've got a lot of questions. And so we're here today to have a very rigorous conversation about these things. But I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been an extraordinarily challenging time. But the silver lining in this is that we can push equity and excellence in education at this time as well. Thank you, Juliet. We appreciate you being here. And we'll wrap it up with healthcare IT specialist and mother, Ebony Griffin. Hi, Ebony. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to the discussion tonight. Uh, again, my name is Ebony Griffin. I am a healthcare IT specialist. Uh, I've been a consultant for the last 17 years here in the Cypress area. Uh, I have two school-age children in Cypher ISD. And as we know, technology is on the forefront of us moving forward as a society. And our kids are, are no different than the, result, the adults in the workspace right now. So um, well, I'm looking forward to discussion and, and, and just sharing all those things that technology will be doing to help both online and in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Thanks for right. having me. Thank you. Yes, thank you to all of you for, for being here. So we will gonna, we're will we going to go ahead and get to it. Uh, our first question is going to go to Dr. Uh, Rochelle Whitaker. Uh, question is, for families who have multiple school-aged children, how can parents access their child's mental health, uh, ac uh, assess rather, uh, I think that's probably what it meant to say, assess mm -hmm. their child's mental health in a COVID-19 world? Mm -hmm. I think this is an excellent question, and I know it all too well. If you have multiple children, and you're at home, it's hard to find time to give to each child separately, right? You just kind of get caught up in everything that's going on. But I think what's most important right now is that if you have, you know, multiple children to take some time with each child and talk to them about how they're feeling or just and, and make it an activity. So maybe you're just going outside for a walk or, you know, playing outside in the dirt or playing basketball because kids tend to open up more when they're doing things. And they'll just let the conversation, you're just having a converse, simple conversation, you know, how are things going? How are you feeling? And they'll start to tell you, I don't like this, or I'm worried about school starting back, or I'm nervous about what this looks like. And so having that time gives you the ability to kind of assess their mental health and find out what's going on with them, because without talking to them, you won't really know. And we know that kids sometimes, um, you can also you know, tell by kids behavior, because some kids aren't able to articulate as well. But a lot of times just talking to them, you know, make it in a fun five, 10 minute activity. That's true. And sometimes, Rochelle, you've got to sort of work your way in from little sideways angles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes kids don't handle those direct questions real well. But if you start talking about Cheetos, you can somehow find a way into talking <laughs> about classrooms, right? Yes, exactly. That's why it's good to talk to them while they're doing something because they they're not thinking, right? Right, right. Good point. So, okay, this next question is really for anybody uh, in the panel. So if you feel like you want to address this, go for it. It's from Rebecca V. And she's wondering, and of course, there's all this talk about the quality of education these days, you know, with online and, and people worry that their kids just aren't quite getting the same education. So Rebecca asks, what impact will this year have on our children's future? 
future education if our kids are currently in elementary school? From a social standpoint, is it healthier to have our kids in a classroom environment where they get to interact with other kids, even if the academics aren't as good? Who wants to take that? I'll take it. <laughs> okay, go for it. Um, and so what I think um, that parents don't realize is that socializing at school looks very different right now than what it looks previously. And so when you talk about um, academics and socializing, so kids going to school right now, I don't know how much socializing they're getting. I mean, they, they're able to talk to each other, but they have on masks, they're social distancing. And so some kids may have more challenges with that than they would doing things virtual. So I think when we start talking about, you know, how are our kids handling things and sending them back to school and they'll be able to socialize, remember that socializing looks very different for them and that it can be kind of scary. You know, the younger your child is going into an environment where they're not doing the same things, even their teachers aren't even doing the same things. So they're not as touchy feely, they're more hands off. You can't tell if your teacher is smiling behind a mask or if they're upset. And if you're a young child, it's hard for you to gauge social cues. So I think that, you know, parents should take into consideration um, that socializing, while it's good, it's very different right now than it, what it looked like before. So I think, I think right now we need to be more concerned about mental health across the board, parents and children. Um, academics is important too, don't get me wrong, but I think right now we need to focus on our kids' you know, mental well-being. I could also add that kids are, our kids have grown up in a screen-filled world. They are used to interacting with screens. Uh, my fourth grader in the spring, uh, I can assure you fourth grade Zoom is adorable. They all started logging on earlier and earlier so they could talk to one another. Uh, so their interactive sessions turned into an hour of a bunch of Zoom socializing before the classes began. So don't think that by keeping them home, you're depriving them of all socialization. I was going to say too for uh, for my children specifically one of the things that the, the moms and the parents have done is kind of talk with each other um, in groups and set up time to do zoom socialization so lunchtime uh, on the weekends and just ha having them the opportunity to be able to see one another and socialize outside of school has really helped a lot which a lot of times they're doing anyway if they're like you said linda um having screen time they're relating with each other on when they have free time video games or in other ways that they are interacting and so i i made a joke earlier that we are in the age of the jetsons it, this was kind of something that we've already seen and so we're learning how to to do this because we know right now that COVID is not totally going away we're going to we're starting to see the flu season come on and so we, we have to be a little bit more creative uh, with their socialization and it may look like a virtual more virtual interactions uh, speaking of interaction and socialization, that brings me to our next question. And and I myself have not loved the term social distancing because we were made to be social creatures. And right. so they, they should have just come up, whoever came up with that should have come up with something else, I believe. But having said that, uh, Jocelyn M has her question and it is, is there a safe way to allow kids to play so they maintain social skills and mental health, but keep them socially distanced so they stay safe from COVID? I think this goes back to the conversation that we were having talking about the utilization of technology in new and creative ways. And so we know that um, Zoom and all these different things that we've been using, look, we're doing this teletown hall in a way that we've never done before. And so we're connecting with new people. Um, you know, the question is, do families have the appropriate hardware, internet access and the digital instructions and digital fluency that they need to be able to appropriately interact? And so it's especially important for parents and guardians and loved ones to just take that extra attention to spend with their, their child at home uh, to make sure that there's robust hugs and loves and attention. Um, remember kids model after parents. So if parents are stressed and, and having issues, they need to make sure that they're taking care of their mental health as well. And so I think that, you know, we're in unprecedented times and our children are very resilient. Um, but, you know, it's like we've got to give them the opportunity to be able to continue to socialize. We are physically distancing, but we have to always continue to socialize our children.
Thank you, Julia. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. I think our children are more resilient than we are. <laughs> I know as, as a parent, I'm sort of living and breathing by the emails that come from my child's school because they dictate how the next couple of days and weeks will look. So this next question is to Judge KP George, and it talks about the importance of communication with parents in school districts. Um, I'm living and breathing by it at the moment, and I'm wondering how can it be improved? Uh, you know, <laughs> It's so important, as you know, because one thing we all need to understand, nobody know and nobody have an exact answer because we are all walking through an uncharted or or we have no idea what next coming. So we know that it is, I know that it is so important. That's the very reason why even though I, as a county judge, I don't do a lot of, uh, um, you know, education related things, but we actually had numerous Zoom conversation with our area superintendents. And, you know, we actually brought it, uh, put it on Facebook and so that people could see what are the preparation the school districts are doing. And then what I come to know from each and every one of them I talked to, I realized there is a lot of preparation because like we all need to understand parents children everybody need to understand so we are going through we all are doing our best to deal with the the situation so my communication is the most important thing and communication how to be both ways and one thing i learned is every parents you know then what i heard from the administrators reach out to us if you have any question reach out to us communicate with us and the school districts under my observation i have noticed they are doing everything possible to communicate with the parents and but understand just when you talk about fort bend isd for example when you're dealing with 75000 78000 children and it is always room for improvement so i encourage parents to reach out to your uh, teachers and the schools and they do they all are standing by um, to support and help and and so uh, this is actually a learning uh, experience for every one of us in my opinion last seven months i've been learning every single day um, and we are trying to communicate with our citizens on a daily basis um, that's the reason why you said you see me often um, you know um, so we try to do the best we can so the school districts are doing and definitely communication always we can improve um, so but i believe it is you know our parents have to take their initiative and uh, the school districts are doing in my opinion and otherwise communicate with the school and let them know what you expect and you know under the circumstances i believe everybody is trying to do their best all right, thank you. Thank you for that, Judge. Uh, next question, we have a question from our comment section. This one is from Linda Smith to everyone, so all of you can jump in uh, on this answer. Uh, her question is, would having face masks with see-through plastic fronts not be a good idea for teachers so that children can see the teacher's mouth? I think uh, what a lot of us have discovered over, the, over these last few months is we didn't realize how much we relied on reading lips to communicate and hear what someone's saying. And you, know, you go into a store and you're trying to speak to the clerk and we're having to ask two or three times what they said and they're asking us. Um, so how about that? Is it, would it be a good idea to have see-through plastic fronts for, for teachers so that communication between them and, and students would be a little better? So I know see-through, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. No, I, I know that see-through plastic masks are something that is being worked on, uh, especially for our patients in the hospital who are hard of hearing, who very much rely on lip reading. Uh, to my knowledge, we do not have an FDA approved see-through mask because masks are medical equipment. They do have to go through testing, but I know that this is actively being worked on by multiple groups. So I'm hoping that sometime in the next few months, we will have viable disposable see-through masks because they're a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we forgot how important that lip reading was. Did anybody else want to chime in on that before we go on to the next question? Yes, I did. I actually wanted to state that um, for students who are hearing impaired or cognitively impaired, Mm -hmm. they do rely on facial cues as well as lip reading. My child, uh, I actually have a middle schooler who is in that situation. And even with the technology and being able to look at the teacher, sometimes there's a lag in that in that interface. And so being able to actually see the teacher is very important. So if we could come come up with something that would allow them to do that, it would greatly improve, I think, the interaction and engagement of the students. 
I agree. You know, we forget how much our facial expressions speak. And so all, our kids are missing out on that because they don't see the full expression. And I think there's probably confusion in the interpretation as well because we're just relying on the voice and the sound of that. Uh, I'd like to go on uh, to this next question from Tiffany. And I have a feeling, Dr. Uh, Rochelle Whitaker, you're going to want to jump in on this. Um, she's talking about the signs to look out for if your child is struggling emotionally with virtual learning. And we know these first couple of days have not been easy for a lot of children and their families. So there's that part of the question, plus to discuss parents' anxiety about sending their children to school, signs that parents need to look for to allow their children to go back to school. Yes. So when what things you want to look for if your child is having difficulty um, virtually. And so this is something I know very well because my oldest son had difficulty last year because he was like it was noisy. He couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. He didn't have enough time to get his work done. It, he was just so overwhelmed. And so um, I would say if you're paying attention to your pay attention to your child's behavior, because um, kids at this age, again, they express a lot through their behavior. So if they are disengaged, more often than not from the family, from their siblings, from you as a parent, if they um, don't, um, if they seem sadder than usual. I mean, you know, some kids, um, their disposition is just kind of one of, it's just kind of blah, blah you know, kind of mad. Well, that's a teenager. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so it may be kind of, so you have, but so it have to be on the extreme end of that, right? If they're just mad, um, it's the extreme end of that. If they just um, seem just, unhappy and um, I would hope that parents could you know kind of decipher what their kids unhappiness looks like not just like I'm unhappy because we're in a virtual setting but just this you know unhappiness every day waking up just um, not feeling like I want to get out of bed just lack of motivation those are some things to look for or just severe behavior changes so they're acting out they're talking back they're not listening because um, I went through that period of time too I was like the whose kids are these <laughs> um, so you know their behavior is drastically different those are things to look out for if your child is struggling virtually Damn. Right. I was going to say, I think it's also important to um, talk with the teachers and, and see what they notice. Um, I know for me, I'm in between telemedicine and meetings and all these things. And so I'm not able to pay as much attention um, when my kids are in school. But one way to help to figure that out is to talk with the teachers and see if they're noticing um, any changes or differences um, in the child. So that would be another way to kind of assess what's going on. I also want to say this too, like meltdowns are normal, right? The parents melting down, the kids melt down, everybody's melting down. It's okay, right? It gets it gets better with time and once we're getting more used to it. But meltdowns are, are normal. I know my six-year-old is, is like, the teacher didn't see me. The teacher didn't see me and she's trying to get through the entire class. And, and so th that can happen. So I want to say just, be cognizant that it's okay because i have i have meltdowns too like i, I really do so it's okay <laughs> know that feeling for sure <laughs> And, all right. We, uh, we just want to uh, remind our participants that if you have questions, you can submit those in the, the comment section. Also, if you would like to voice your um, question live, uh, just let us know by hitting the raise, raise your hand function and uh, we'll open up your microphone and, and we'll be able to see you and you can ask your, your question live. Um, next, next question is going to go to uh, Dr. Yancey and I think um, uh, Dr. Richmond probably will want to jump in on this as well. Um, question comes and is asked, are there extra steps my teenagers can take to keep the rest of the family safe? Now, we've, we've heard uh, um, about all the steps over the last few months. Maybe there are more. But, you know, there are a lot of parents that I've talked to in the last couple of weeks who are, you know, concerned about kids, you know, not wearing their masks, maybe not being as, you know, as healthy and washing hands and hand sanitizer when, they're, when they go back to school. Is there anything extra that teenagers or any kids can do to, to make sure they they do their best to keep the family safe when they're going to school and coming back home. So now is the time to enlist your teenagers to help out with modeling for the younger kids. Um, you know, we have a generation of very mature teenagers in our kids these days. You know, enlist them, you know, help them, help their brothers and sisters remember to wear their masks. Also, they can model behavior like when they come home, they go straight to the sink and wash their hands. Um, I have a couple of teenagers who will take off their clothes, put them in the washer and take a shower and point out 
out very specifically to their siblings that they're doing this. Just modeling good behavior for the younger kids, it will help reinforce the behavior in the teenagers and it'll help reinforce the behavior in the younger kids. You know, our teenagers uh, can really be our partners in this. Yeah. And I think as, as scary as COVID-19 is, you look at the uh, things that we can do to be safe, you know, washing your hands and making sure that you follow these precautions and wearing a mask and using your hand sanitizer and engaging in physical distancing. These are things that a person young and old can participate in and it requires good modeling, changing of habits and just a reinforcement. And when a person's doing a great job, you know, praising them and thanking yes. them for making mm -hmm. their difference and keeping lives safe and healthy. Yeah, that positive reinforcement is everything and it always generates more good behavior and good modeling like Linda said. So that's a wonderful, wonderful suggestion. A question came in from Sierra S and this is interesting. I don't know who's gonna to wanna to tackle this, but she asks, if my child is continuing with online learning, can the school kick them out of athletics overall, even if they return later in the school year? Anybody know? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that might be a, a specific school question, right? Not just an overall one. Do you think KP George? Um, I don't, I don't have a correct answer for it. It yeah. may be it's better to reach out to the school in my opinion and find out with the athletic director or the school administration to find out what, what will happen. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. But and also, each school district have their own policies. Right. Especially they are developing these days. So I don't have. I don't want to say something which I don't know. I don't mm. know. Right. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Yeah. I think yeah, the best advice is just to contact, contact your, your campus. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Okay. Um, another question from our. Oh, did anyone else want to, to say anything about that? No. Okay. Um, next question. This is another one that uh, we have from our comment section. This one comes from Karina, and uh, she asks, do you think in current, uh, current conditions there are significant challenges in learning for middle schoolers if they do in person or, or, or virtually? I guess the, the difference there, you know, I think um, typically the younger the child is, uh, possibly the more difficult it's going to be to keep their attention in front of a uh, a, a computer for you know a few hours at a time but whoever uh, wanted to tackle that one um, she uh, she asked do you think in the current conditions there are significant challenges in learning for middle schoolers younger students if they do in person uh, or, or virtually which one would be better for them I think is what she's trying to ask I think that there are challenges however I think there are more opportunities for us to overcome those challenges especially through the use of technology now so for those who are actually going to school virtually, um, there are a, a multitude of opportunity for them to receive the pre-content of the work and the classwork, which allows them to actually review the material and understand what's going to be um, discussed in class activities, which help them to be more engaged um, so they can really, really close the gap in that learning. Sometimes um, pre-pandemic, you know, you kind of step into a classroom and then you're introduced to a new subject matter and then you're asked to engage right then and there. But I think we actually have a little bit of, of, of leverage, um, an opportunity to overcome that challenge by actually having that beforehand. Uh, my children especially like it. Um, they actually like learning virtually. They actually can act, get on and see what's ahead, what they have to do. And for some of it, they kind of work at their own pace. And then when it's time for them to actually have that large group classroom discussion, they feel confident because they actually know the material. The silver lining, Ebony, thank you. I'm, I'm glad there was some of that to share. That's a good one. Um, and I know in this next question, it's from Kathleen, and it's to everybody. And Dr. Taria Richmond, you touched upon this a little bit, but her uh, question to everybody is this. We know that anxiety and depression among children is at an all time high. Are we equipping our teachers with the knowledge required to recognize the signs and symptoms of a mental health condition? So there's several organizations that exist um, that have been trying to provide support to school districts. One is Mental Health America of Greater Houston and the Collaborative for School Behavioral Health. So they've had a long lasting uh, relationship with the schools providing teachers and, and staff members with uh, 
information about uh, recognizing mental health conditions in, in children. And they developed a lot of different um, unique rubrics after Hurricane Harvey. And those came in very handy now, uh, now that we have this new global pandemic presenting a whole new set of scenarios. Um, also, there's uh, other different types of organizations that are coming into fruition. Um, the city of Houston is collaborating with Baylor College of Medicine and the Be Well, Be Connected program to try to provide telemedicine and mental health supports for children with severe emotional disturbances. Um, and so there's, there's things that are available, but I would strongly encourage parents to ask the schools, you know, are they participating with these organizations? What is being done? Once again, as, as Judge George said, it's always good to ask, it's always good to have a good rapport and relationship with the school. It's your school, it's your schoolhouse, and just have this dynamic relationship, especially now when information is so critically important. I just wanted to add there because as a school board member, I always used to say that, you know, uh, when I interact with uh, parents, I always said, do you, do, does your teacher know you by first name? Uh, I'm talking about the parent. And so, because see, many parents, many, many parents do an amazing job connecting with the school and their teachers. And my wife is a teacher, um, an elementary school teacher, and she always said the best thing is the engaged parents, and you ask anybody. And so this is actually an opportunity for our parents to be more engaged and I know it is challenging, and but I believe this is this is always challenges bring opportunities, and and I see that personally. More parents are more and more engaged in their uh, children's life than it used to be. Um, that's my observation, and it's a good thing. And get engaged and communicate with the teachers on a regular basis. And 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 I see that my wife teaching from home virtually, and so she see that and most of most cases our children are very much they know how to adapt and many times the problem is uh, adults just to keep it here just for a moment because this is such a critically important issue that all, all of you will know that uh, you know bullying has been uh, become such a big problem over over the years and and numbers show that uh, depression among students goes up usually toward the beginning of the year and 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 part of that is because of the bullying that they receive when they come back to school so that that's one part of the question um, uh, the other uh, issue that that some kids sadly have been dealing with is when they go home that's where they are abused and uh, and sadly a lot of those students have been subjected to that longer uh, because they weren't going to school in the spring uh, they actually were there with with their abuser a, a, a lot more often what is being done and i think this is something that you know we can hear from all of you on what what is being done uh, and, and what signs can teachers and neighbors and, and anyone who cares about these kids look for to to make sure that that they are getting the 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 mental and the physical and the emotional help that they need if they're either one going to be dealing with bullying as they head back to school or they've been unfortunately part of an abusive situation for the last couple of months I think what's interesting is that, um, you know, we talk about bullying, but so much bullying that was taking place was cyberbullying. And so, you know, one of the things that kids have struggled with is not just, it used to be you would go to school and you would get bullied and then you could come home and get some peace and rest and a break from it. But what's happening now is you, you, you come home and the bullying, it gets worse. So people are on, you know, kids are on their, um, phones and iPads and they're sending pictures and sharing things. And so there is no break. Um, and so, you know, what I would say for parents, if you are having a child that has been bullied, um, to take more notice, even more so now of what's happening on the electronics, what's happening, um, you know, in the chat rooms and things like that, so that you can be more cognizant because it's, it's, been happening probably um, alarmingly more cyberbullying has been taking place. But I would say for parents right now, if that has, you know, if that's something that you've con you're concerned about to make note of what's happening, you know, when your child is online and then, you know, take some control over how much time they're able to spend online to just kind of curtail that. Um, and then as far as the kids who are being abused um, at home and teachers kind of looking out for that, um, 
I'm going to just say that I think that this virtual world makes it a little bit more difficult because some schools don't require the kids to have their cameras on. So it's, you know, you don't know what's really happening. Um, but I would say, you know, have teachers to kind of make kids feel comfortable reaching out to them. So maybe, you know, having a time, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, a check in, you know, how are you doing? Maybe one on one, um, which I know can be uh, that's asking teachers to do one more thing. Um, but I think if a teacher has a student um, that, you know, maybe is not logging in, I, I've known teachers to call parents and say, hey, your child's not on. Their, their screen is not on. They're logged in. I can't see them. Um, what's happening? And so the parent is like, oh, <laughs> they're at home with their dad. Let me let me call him, you know, um, and see what's happening. So, you know, staying, um, you know, just noticing different things. But like I said, right now it's difficult because if kids don't have to have their screens on you really there's no way to know what's happening yeah it looks like in our um comment section um several of our participants are sharing some resources uh to deal with those those very very issues so uh, for those of you who are participating and, and if if this is an issue of concern for you if you go to our comments section uh you can there's some 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 really good resources there to to deal with, uh, you know, what is certainly a, a, a troubling issue and also, uh, uh, yes, Juliet, yes, please. So, you know, this is an area where we see, you know, teachers, principals, support staff serve as such critical supports for families. And, you know, we, we talk about um, Dr. Simshaw, who's, uh, uh, you know, participates in the Mayor's Herd Task Force, was talking about how the number of children um, going and getting inpatient mental health services has dramatically declined. It's not that the cases have dropped, they probably escalated, it's just not somebody there providing them with the resources and the referral. Or like what we're describing, you know, if a child doesn't have a teacher or an advocate there that can see if they have bruising, changes in their behavior, who is there to serve as an advocate for them? So, you know, the virtual online is important, but as Dr. Whitaker said, you need a camera. So that way you can check in and see how the child is doing. You need to see them and physically put your eyes on them to see if there's any changes and things along those lines. So these things are dynamic. There has to be more resources available. There has to be greater information about these supports that exist. And there has to be technology like teleservices services that are available, whether for mental health, physical health, but also for these referrals to critical resources. Our schools provide so many social, emotional, different types of resources to help families in need. And many people are not aware of that. And so I just wanna say a huge thanks to all of the educators and teachers and support staff who provide so much to our community. We are so deeply grateful and thankful for all you do. Thank you, Juliet. Our next question addresses something that I think we all face, those of us with children and older parents. This is from Marissa, and she says, if we choose to send our children back to face-to-face -face instruction, should we refrain from having them around our older parents, 78, 85? I'm assuming those are the ages of her parents. And she said, if so, for how long? I so wish I we had a... Oh, go ahead, Linda. go ahead. Go, go ahead, Dr. Okay, what I was going to say is I wish we had a good answer to that question. Yeah. You know, how long? Nobody knows at this point. So uh, we are we are going into this with so little information. Um, certainly and can we also address to what that separation from our elderly parents and grandparents does. I mean, there's their mental health as well as we're concerned about their physical health at the same time. I mean, it's such a myriad of things. Yeah, Dr. Richmond. So uh, definitely, the, we have to think about our our cohorts, and as we uh, separate out from our immediate cohorts, meaning the people that we live with, um, that are we are surrounded around on a daily basis, and what that looks like when we go out and come back into a space, and it does cause uh, some separation gaps. And when I'm seeing my patients on telemedicine, whether they're younger or more seasoned, this is one of the main complaints is I'm separate from everybody that I love. And what do I what do I do about it? And so again, we're, we're, get, we're looking at um, how can we close this gap? And I was just thinking earlier when they asked the question about the children socializing, maybe it may look like a, a drive through visit, a you know, a wave from the car um, or, you know, a bike ride away. But 
we definitely have to take this in consideration because I'm seeing it more and more and more. So my patients are calling in for, you know, they maybe their blood pressure or things like that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, this trauma, this experience of COVID is, is it's tough on, it's tough on everyone. And like um, Dr. Yancey said, this is probably the one of the first times as a medical doctor where I've had to say, I don't know. And, and not only that, I don't know, I really don't have someone I can refer you to, or I don't have the information where I can look it up and give a, you know, bottom line answer. And so it's frustrating for, for everyone. But I think um, what Ms. Juliet said about everyone working together, we're seeing that more and more, especially in Houston, uh, we're coming together to really work together and look out for one another. And I think that's what we'll have to do um, going forward is just checking in you know, virtually or a drive through some way or another, checking in with one another and just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. It goes a long way. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question uh, comes from uh, Karina. And um, we, we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, this is obviously an issue that, that's important to a lot of parents. Um, I, I, you know, I have four daughters and one of them still a teenager. And um, but imagine it's, Teenagers have a tough, a tough time communicating. Imagine that. Uh, but Karina's question is, how should we engage high schoolers to open up on this mental health issue, this very important aspect? Uh, should they, we have them reach out to their counselors or should parents reach out to their counselors, et cetera? Um, she, uh, she says she sees a resistance from them, uh, from her teenagers to discuss this issue. Again, surprise, surprise, but uh, the old problem of teenagers not necessarily being the best communicators. And so I would, you know, kind of go back to, you know, what I said before, engage them in an activity so that you're not having a direct, they don't feel like they're being attacked. So just, you know, spending time with them and just asking them general questions like, you know, you know, how was your day or tell me about your, your friends or what's going on, you know, at school or what's going on with whatever things that they're involved in and just let the conversation kind of happen naturally because a lot of times kids will start to tell you things when you're not asking them specifically um like you know are you depressed mom i don't want to talk what <laughs> you know it's there you know teenagers are not going to just say yes but i found that when you're playing a game and you're doing different things they'll just have conversation and then you can ask a question based on something that they've said and they, they're not thinking about it. So then they just start talking about it. Um, so I would say, you know, just let it evolve, um, you know, look out for different things, but I would say kind of let it evolve on its, on its own. Um, I think the good thing about a lot of things that they're watching right now is that um, therapy is kind of trending. So um, a lot of um, what's on, you know, reality shows is talking about going to see a therapist. And so um, teens are now saying, hey, I want a therapist or I want to talk to somebody. And so if, if they come to you with it, then it, it's easy. It's great. Um, but if they're not, you know, just making it kind of light and just in conversation and doing things, cleaning up the kitchen, just having a conversation and let it evolve. I was going to say, too, don't discount social media. So um, you can use things like if you have to be in tune with it, of course, you have to take a look. For example, with TikTok, there's always different um, subject matters on TikTok that people are sharing. You know, young people are sharing, oh, I feel depressed. This is what I went through. And just saying, hey, I saw so-and-so on TikTok. What did you think about that? Because you, you definitely have to meet them where they are. My son is 11 and it feels like he's 17. And so this is where we have to, you know, meet them where they are and just the, what's going on in pop culture bring it up hey so and so something happened with him that rapper what do you think about that and you may be able to get more engagement because they realize that you are in tune with their world mm -hmm. um i also wanted to say from a school perspective these discussions can come through the work what they're reading what they're learning um right now they're reading a book called the outsiders and mm -hmm. this movie we watched the movie as well and i noticed it has so many different topics in it and so sitting down and 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 participating with my son about, oh, you know, what did you think about Pony Boy and what he did? It, it allows them to kind of open up and share. So definitely meet them, meet them where they are. And social media right now is, is where they are. So meeting them there will help as well. Yeah, just kind of reiterate what you all have been saying. Um, Barbara Witt shares in the comment section. She just says, my teens talk the most to me during dinner. The conversation is relaxed and they tend to share more. So 
that kind of go, go, goes exactly in line with, with what you all are, are saying there. Yeah, I would even go further to even ask the the student or the, the teen, not just what you think of it, of that situation and what's going on, but how would you handle it? What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. If that was your mm -hmm. friend, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed what they would say um, about that. And it could really just kind of help them open up and then come to some type of, you know, a recommendation or some strategy that you that you all can go through. I want yeah. to add that, you know, children and teenagers might have different types of symptoms that we're not accustomed to seeing in them. Um, they might have a headache or body pains or difficulty with attention and concentration. So, you know, other than crying or, or seeing sad or excessively worried, there might be other things that you should pay very close attention to. But as folks, you know, are saying that just opening up this conversation, also empowering teens to be a part of the solution, you know, talking to them about um, their feelings and also potentially about different apps that are available that are specifically focused on meditation and mindfulness and, and dealing with anxiety, breathing techniques and things along those lines that they can share with adults as well. So it's a two-way conversation. We're all learning and we're all growing at this point. So, But you're right. We do have to get into their world and on their level. And I think so many of you brought up those valid points, you know, see what they're watching on social media and ask them leading questions right? Not the types of questions that generate a yes or a no or a huh, <laughs> just to get the conversation going. Just wanted to let everybody know we've got about eight minutes left. Um, and if anybody has a question to ask live, you know, feel free to go ahead and do that too. I do want to move on to a question from Kathleen. And she wants to talk about if anybody could discuss the children getting left behind in the transition to virtual learning. For example, children who might ha not have access to a computer or strong Wi-Fi to support a virtual class. And also, what about the kids who may have dropped out due to the impacts of the par pandemic? I mean, parents losing job. You know, what about the fallout from all of that? Oh, this is such a, um, a significant issue. Inequity in digital access existed before COVID. And prior to COVID, uh, access to technology was considered almost like a luxury. It was like, oh, you know, it's like uh, having internet access, high speed and a computer that's readily available was something that, you know, was uh, not necessarily something that was immediately available for all children. And so now we're playing catch up. And it's a significant amount of investments that need, that is needed. It's a three-legged stool. Um, you know, as I said before, you need the computer, you need the internet access, but then you also need parents, teachers, and students, everybody to have that digital fluency to be able to use the technology to the highest capacity. So there are many different efforts from project connectivity at the statewide level to push out millions of computers. There's also efforts to get internet access and hotspots to students. It's a work in progress. We are internationally competing with, with folks globally, nationally trying to get computers. And so um, I know that uh, I saw on the news today, there, were, there was a teacher and the teacher said, we ask you know, folks to please uh, keep patience in your heart as we travail these very difficult times. But the fierce urgency of now is so critical. So we must, um, you know, in an upcoming legislative session, ask for additional funding for our schools, for technology. And we have to continue to come up with bright, collaborative, transformative ways of bringing schools, companies, state, state, federal, local dollars, all bridging them together to make sure that our kids have the uh, digital equity that they so rightfully deserve and need at this point. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all for that. Uh, again, just a couple more minutes left. So if anyone has a question that they would like to ask live, just uh, let us know in your, uh, the raise your hand function. Uh, this one uh, for uh, Judge, uh, Judge George. Uh, quick question from uh, one of the participants. Why is it important for parents and educational systems to increase uh, communication between themselves, especially during the pandemic, which is a constantly moving and evolving issue? Talk about the, the need to, to have that constant communication. Simply because, in my opinion, we don't really know. Um, uh, like, like from the beginning, uh, we all said, you know, we are all um, uh, traveling through a uncharted um, uh, territory, and where we don't know what is happening. And, and in my opinion, you know, I have seen so much 
in last um, you know six seven months I have seen uh, human behavior I have seen um, people putting everything on the side and going and helping the neighbors and and I have seen the other side where people are you know fighting with each other and you know so so bringing out a lot of a um, lot of differences and a lot of best uh, mostly best thing in uh, people and answer your question I believe you know since I don't know that I learned you need to ask somebody and you know there is a resources out there and you know and my conversation with the superintendents and other leaders in school districts various school districts in Fort Bend area and they all said we are here to help and we all know that there is a lot of questions parents have children have and also in the past you know when the school start many cases you know parents focused on their their, um, their job and their, you know, um, duties as um, taking care of their part. And many times the children, uh, you know, were taken care of at uh, school. I'm not saying all of them, but many cases, the education part was uh, passed on to uh, the, the, the teachers and the school system. But now all of a sudden I had, uh, when we did the Facebook Live, there are some parents coming and saying, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm completely stuck. I don't know where to start and how to move forward. And that's the very reason why you need to communicate with the school system, communicate with the, and we talk about numerous um, support groups. And, and if you feel any, you know, physical, mental struggles and all that stuff, there's, I come to find out there is, there is a support group for anything, any challenge you're facing, but you need to go out and seek in my opinion. And it's, I believe it is common sense. It is so important because together we will combat this COVID-19 situation. There is no doubt in my mind. But but of course, and also in my opinion, it's actually teaching us to learn so many things we never thought about. And you know, so and so this pandemic is going to make all of us hopefully better people, better managing people when it comes to, uh, you know, pandemic or any kind of challenges. So the best way to do is, in my opinion, simply ask. You will receive an answer if you are honestly seeking it. It's out there. Yeah, I think we've all learned how, how priceless the human condition is, and it's brought everybody back to that. I would say probably the biggest takeaways from this discussion are the fact that everybody is so concerned about their children's mental health. And so the importance of that discussion and making sure our children are healthy, no matter what environment we choose for them to be in. And, and like uh, KP George was saying, you know, things change. And the other part is just that constant level of communication and awareness and making sure that we're all on the right page. Um, because I think if we're anxious as parents, then we pass that down to our children who feel that equal amount of stress. And so I, I don't know, this has been uh, fascinating. And I think maybe, do we have time for one more question? I, I think we have time to sneak one more in if we make it all quick. Right. Keith, you want to handle it? Yeah, yeah. This comes from C. Fisk. C. Fisk asks, "What do we do to support students who are only are only child only children? Uh, because their emotional well being uh, is very important during this time as well. Obviously, you know they don't have anyone at home um, if, if if parents aren't there while they're in school, uh, and they they don't have that social interaction with fellow students. And so, how how do we support students who are only children?" I would say in the same way that we were talking about socializing before, making use of the virtual environment, setting up virtual play dates and virtual activities. Um, and then, you know, if you have family members that are close in age doing the same thing so they can have a, a constant um, communication with others their age or in their same age group. So I would say, you know, just utilizing um, the virtual world to the best of um, our abilities to have them, you know, be able to socialize. And then maybe as parents realizing that, okay, they can't do as much as they were able to. So making it more of a point to spend more time with them to be able to, to account for some of the lapse in the socialization. Great. Okay, so we're going to give everybody just sort of their final 30 seconds to wrap up their thoughts. Uh, Dr. Taria Richmond, you want to start? Yes, absolutely. So again, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I look forward to the day that we are past COVID, but while we're in it, I am, uh, I am sure that we will support one another and that our children will be just fine. And again, as I say this, in general, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yancey. 
Yeah, I'd just like to echo that. Our kids are resilient. They are going to get through this probably better than we will. But I'd just like to take a moment to remind everybody, we are coming into flu season. Uh, the last thing we need on top of COVID is a bad influenza year. So it is vitally important that everybody, especially the kids, get their flu shot this fall. Dr. Whitaker? Um, yes. Yeah, so if parents, if you are struggling and you are looking for additional tips, I um, have created an acronym and I have some tips. If you go to back to school countdown.info, you can get additional tips to help you just navigate this COVID-19 um, school year. So um, I know that we'll get through it, but I do know that parents are struggling and they need help and resources. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Judge George. And I would say, you know, um, one of the biggest problem in we are living in a social media driven world and I encourage people to get information from the right source and reach that is going to be maybe a school districts or uh, any other resources, get it from the right source and together I have no doubt we will prevail. There is no question. Thank you. And Juliet Stepich. Um, well, in the chat, I've provided several different telephone numbers for all different sorts of resources uh, based on the conversations that we've had today. Mental health is something that's extraordinarily important. Mayor Turner's had two teletown halls devoted to this subject. And so I just want to say to everyone, please take good care of yourself. We love you. We're Houston strong. You know, mask up, wash your hands, engage in physical distancing. Uh, we are all in this together and we're all a part of the solution. So be well, do well and uh, have a very good school year, even though it's under the most unusual set of circumstances. Okay. All right, and last but certainly not least, uh, Ebony Griffin. Hi, thank you so much for this discussion this evening. I would say that uh, I would encourage those to continue to use technology with the understanding that technology is a resource and a tool. It is not a substitution for communication with the uh, between the students and, and and the teachers and the parents and the teachers. If you have access and you can use that tool, I would really encourage those to do so. Um, we are we are experiencing uh, in life, so we wanna breathe and live and move. So having the technology there is just um, supplemental for us. It is, it is not the one all be all. Right, we wanna get back to normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Well, I, it's been a joy to be a part of this. I, I, Keith and I appreciate all of you for joining us this evening and to our participants in the discussion. Uh, we do hope the conversation was helpful and informative. And for any questions that weren't answered or if you have more, please feel free to submit those to our website at click2houston.com. You can also check uh, click2houston.com slash back to school. That's the number two to look for any information that you may have some questions about. But thanks again so, so very much. Uh, we really uh, hope that everyone has an amazing year and just want to thank you all again for taking part. You. Thank, thank you. you. And, thank you. And lots of prayers. Let's not forget that. All right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Good night. Good night.